What follows is free. But if you want to see the full extent of what we do and get involved, go to patreon.com slash word in your ear. Now, on with the show. Welcome to another Word in Your Ear. Now, I think the teenage me would have been shaken to imagine that one day someone would write a book claiming that some of the big hit makers of the 70s, uh, such as Chicory Tip and Middle of the Road and Lieutenant Pigeon, were a valuable reflection of the cultural attitudes of the times and thus massively underappreciated. But now, of course, 50 years later, it seems both laudable and long overdue. It's a fantastic book. It's called In Perfect Harmony. It's the work of an old pal of the podcast, Will Hodgkinson. Will, lovely to see you. Lovely to see you too. Welcome Bob. aboard. Now, how would you, how would you uh, sum up the, the angle of this book? Was that about right, what I said? And what would you add to that? You got it. I think it's a serious look at the silliest music ever made. <laughs> oh, <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I mean, I'd say, okay, so for example, you know, both of you have done great books. Um, there's, I love books by Simon Reynolds and, um, you know, the, the all, all of the books on punk that you get, all the books on prog, all of that stuff. Um, and those, you know, the, those books, when well done, they take that music seriously and they sort of put it into the social context. So I thought, well, that's done. And I love a lot of that music. And I've always been embedded in the 70s, as you might have guessed. Um, but I didn't see much on the sing-along pop world. And I think that's because it's, you know, generally seen as naff, unstylish, hopelessly, you know, um, uh, shallow and, and generally pathetic. And I thought that there must be something more to it than that. First of all, I thought that the songs are so often very, very well constructed and so cleverly written. But also, I just thought this was the era of the single for, you know, for kids, really, and for mums and dads, not so much like serious music fans. And, um, you know, the singles were selling, I mean, Chirpy Chirpy Cheap Cheap sold 10 million copies. <laughs> I thought, well, there's got to be, there's got to be a story behind that. And it's got to have reflections of the times. And so that's where it started. And what do you, where, where did you first start writing about it? Where did you first, who did you first talk to about it? The first, the begin. well, I, before I spoke to anyone, what got me thinking about the narrative was looking at the, looking at the history of this music and looking for discovering that in 1970, Mark Bolan, who I'd always loved, was making the this, this shift from Tyrannosaurus Rex to T-Rex and, you know, putting on a few women's clothes from Bebo and a bit of glitter on his cheeks and, and you know, reducing the songs right down and then getting Hot Love and, and Ride a White Swan. And at the same time as Rider White Swan, which is 1970, Clive Dunn's granddad was, you know, aiming for the same number one. And I thought, well, that's interesting. You've got the guy from Dad's Army, who every single mum and dad and kid in the country would have been familiar with, releasing a single as a kind of cash-in. Then you've got this underground guy um, who'd had some success, but not a huge amount of success, thinking, right, I want to go for the kids. I want to be a pop star. I'm going to make it di as direct and as... Um, punchy as possible so it began there and I think from from then obviously Mark Berlin being dead it took me ages to find Tony Visconti well it took it took me ages to convince him to talk to me at first he didn't want to um, so actually that was a bit of a non-starter and I think from there so I looked okay who wrote Grandad it was Herbie Flowers Herbie Flowers I managed to get I, I got a bit of an email interview rather than a proper interview because he's really quite not very well um and then that led to people like roger greenway who wrote so many of those uh early 70s sing-along hits like um like to teach the world to sing roger cook who's over in nashville sue and sunny who are the great session singers tony burrows who sang on four different made-up band songs on the same edition of not of top of the pops allegedly um, and so they, it began there, and I, I wanted to frame it within the decade. So um, it ends with "There's no one quite like Grandma" by the St. Winifred School Choir, which even I can't claim as a lost <laughs> masterpiece. But it felt like that was the end of that was the beginning of the Thatcherite era. Essentially, it was actually 1980, and you know she came in in 1979, and it felt like something had ended then. It's you really know? interesting that because I always think of the, "There's no one quite like Grandma." As the kind of beginning of the smash hits era, really. You know what well, I mean? That the eighties was right. a kind of rejection of the, of some Winifred School Choir, you know, <laughs> glamorous pop music. Interesting also 
Uh, one of the things I noticed that you kind of referred to there, you seem to have interviewed an awful lot, a lot of people called Tony. <laughs> Tony, Tony's a very 70s well, name. Well, a very 70s name, that is. <laughs> and a lot yeah, of those people you said were absolutely thrilled to be talked to, because, I mean, I guess, A, no one had kind of taken them seriously before, and, and B, it had been a long time since they'd been interviewed. What that's kind of very, people are you talking true. about? Yeah, that's very true, and sometimes there's a, a degree of nervousness because, um, you know, these are people who had not had critical acclaim. Um, <laughs> what kind of bit who, who are you talking about here? To say the least. To yeah, say the least. Uh, okay, well, let's say Mike Batt. Okay, now Mike yeah, Batt yeah, yeah. was a classical auteur, self-taught really, and, you know, he thought he was going to, um, you know, do this kind of progressive masterpiece, and he'd, he'd made some semi-psychedelic songs in the late 60s. He went off to L.A., um, thinking that it was, you know, he was the bee's knees. It all fell apart. He came back with his tail between his legs. And that's when he had the idea of doing the Wombles. Now, I think if you look at those Wombles songs, they're brilliant pastiches of all the different styles around. And so you look at Underground Overground, that's basically a pop song pretending to be rock, which is the same as Slade and Sweet. Um, they had Orinoco's Dream, which is a, you know, a progressive epic. Um, so Yeah, was, yeah, yeah. Each style was kind of very cleverly and in a fun way, um, you know, kind of riffed off, so to speak. But he had a very complicated relationship with the Wombles. You know, he'd say that, well, imagine if David Bowie's first hit was The Laughing Gnome. That's right. That's what it, that's that what his entire like. career would have to follow that. Various uh, moments in the book, there's so many to choose from, actually, that we wanted to talk to you about, and, and, and that were just interesting and original and uh, and really unusual. And one, I think, is... is uh, the whole story of the song, the new Seeker song, I'd Like to Teach the World to Sing, which was kind of an advert before it was a hit rather than the other way around. Tell us the story of that song. It's extraordinary. It started off as a song called True Love and Apple Pie, um, which Roger Greenaway and Roger Cook had written um, in the late 60s, and it flopped. And by this point, they were doing little jingles for Coca-Cola. Roger Greenaway and Roger Cook being Bristol-based songwriters who both decided, having been in bands in the 60s, that they didn't really like the touring life and they wanted to be in you know songwriters studios um and they were commissioned to come up with something new for coca-cola and a guy called bill backer was coming over from new york from mccann erickson his plane got diverted and stuck in shannon when it's meant to be coming to london and everyone was fed up as you are when you know your, your plane's diverted because of a storm and then he noticed everyone sitting in the canteen they're drinking coca-cola and then they started chatting to each other and he thought, well, their chat, it's not that Coca-Cola itself is this important thing. It's the, it, they needed something to bring them together. And in this case, it was just a soft drink. So he went to, he got uh, to London the next day. He met Roger Greenway and Roger Cook and told them about this thing. He said, you know, how about, um, you know, I'd like to buy the world a Coke. It's, a, it's like a peace and love anthem. And they said, well, if we if we can do something for peace and love, we wouldn't. It's not the first thing we do. Would be buy the world a coke. He said, "Well, what would you do?" They said, "Well, we'd buy the we'd build the world a home and furnish it with love." Hence, the song came from that. And they said, "Well, we've got this gene," and it came together. And the idea. I mean, actually, I think this is kind of after the event, but I see it very much as a suburban love and peace anthem for all those people who liked houses with wall to wall carpeting, as opposed to you know stinky pongy tent at Woodstock. You know, it's 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 for that, you know, it's for the for this kind of middle class life, I suppose. And anyway, the so, so Coca-Cola was happy. They recorded a version with the new seekers who happened to be in America at the time. And then it came to the advert. And there's a guy called Harvey Gabor, who is uh, going to be the director. And he had this idea of getting all these kids from the streets of Rome um to represent the kind of new slightly hippieish generation but the problem is he picked up a lot of juvenile delinquents <laughs> and they started lobbing bottles of coca-cola at the at the, at the 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 helicopters that came down for the aerial shot and then they're like burying their bottoms at the camera and stuff and say so, all went wrong so right get rid of them we're going to get nice kids and where do you get nice kids from you go around the embassies so he went around all the embassies in in rome and so they're international they're all you know, um, you know, international school kids, you know, yeah. from all over the world, all very, very, very privileged and clean and healthy looking. So he ended up, and so, you know, all those kids you see in that famous advert um, were, dip, you know, diplomats' children, essentially. Um, the advert cost so much money. I think it cost a quarter of a million in 1971, I think it was. 
um, that Bill Backer and Harvey Gabor got the sack. Um, and then it came out and it became a phenomenon almost instantly. It became this huge, huge thing and sort of continues to be. I mean, I don't know if you've seen the final scene in Mad Men, which well, I guess that came out 15, 10, 15 years ago, but Don Draper's has a kind of Sartori revelation. And, um, you know, it's the ultimate capitalist enlightenment where he sees this, he basically, yeah. basically dreaming up, I'd like to teach the world to sing. So that was, that song in a way sums up everything that I was looking at, which is, you know, it was the way in which the mainstream co-ops things that are going on in the underground and uh, refashions it in its own image. And so it was peace and love and all the rest of it, but in a way that was essentially designed to sell a soft drink. And also, the thing that's uh, a kind of drumbeat all the way through this book is television, isn't it? It's, it's, it's one of the things that struck me reading it. This, All this could only have happened, all these songs could have only been famous in a world where there are effectively two television channels, in Britain, anyway. And You're so right. when, when Top of the Pops was on, 25 Everybody million was watching people it. watched yeah, it or mass, whatever. Yeah, mass, event. So, you know... Go on, t talk about that. Well, David, I'm going to ask you, actually, because, you know, the old grey whistle test was was one side of things. And the side I was looking at, and I'm sure you remember it, I'd be interested to know what you guys thought of it at the time, was Supersonic. Mike Mansfield. Mike Mansfield. You know, Keith Slade, you know. Um, it, because that was, that, to me, was the ultimate sing-along pop television show. It was, it was for kids. It was kind of glamorous, you know, sort of Cecil. He was a bit of a Cecil B. DeMille figure with his, you know, his flowing silver locks. And, you know, and you'd see Hello or, yeah. you know, Sailor who, or whoever it was that week um, on this kind of, you know, this raised stage with lots of dry ice and all the rest of it. And, um, but it was also quite cheap. You know, those sets would cost next to nothing. So I'd just be interested to know what you, what the feeling was at the time, because the old grey whistle test would be, the with where the you know the kind of serious music was. well you're talking about two completely different markets because yeah, the, you yeah. know your whole book is about the singles market which is really interesting. Uh, uh, old grey whistle yeah, test couldn't exactly. have been more albums in fact you weren't allowed on the program unless you had an album out. but you know what's interesting about yours from one of the many things is is that, that was the whole new world that 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 uh previously had been kind of rather intellectual uh middle class students who'd been buying records and suddenly it was kind of young girls and it was really old people you know old people buying granddad or whole granddad. families it was that top of the pops yeah. audience so it was a different that's, thing. that's totally correct. That's that's really what I was looking at. It's the singles market, and and like I said, I think Bolin captured that when he put two songs on the B side because it yeah people pocket money. You know, yeah, it went yeah, further. Sure, that's very very true. And I and but also the other thing that struck me all the time was that it's um it's easier to be kind of really expand your consciousness when the going is good. You know, but when when things are really tough as they were by by nineteen seventy three. You know, when you when at the end of 1973, you're going into the three-day week, mass strikes, huge inflation, you know, uh, war in the Middle East. I mean, it was really, really tough for, av you know, the average family. And so what, what's the one source of joy left? It's a single. And at that particular time, it would have been Slade, wouldn't it? And, and the Slade film. The Slade so film. It was that idea that, that these were the songs that were kind of, a, 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 you know, a, a contrast to the grimness of the times, weren't they? Well, it's fascinating, isn't it? Because Slade, Slade to me... Well, Merry Christmas, Everybody, which came out, um, it was 73, 74. That's just when the three-day week hit. And so, and then you had Slade in Flame just a little bit after that. But, you know, you look at May 1973, I think Anthony Barber, who's the Chancellor of the Exchequer, he put up interest rates to 11.5%. It's the highest since the First World War. You had um, the miners striking after being offered a 16.5% pay rise, which sounds like a lot until you, until you consider that inflation was reaching 30%. Yeah, um, yeah. There was the, on top of all this, there was the, um, the Yom Kippur War in 73, which was, you know, as, as I'm sure you guys know, you know, when, um, uh, you know, the Arab countries invaded Israel and then took revenge against the West, essentially, for supporting Israel. And oil went up by 70%. I mean, the Times ran a, a story, which turned out to be not true, saying, the ration cards are already in the post offices. <laughs> and AJP Taylor, you know, the great socialist historian said, 
I've been waiting for the collapse of, his, of, of capitalism all my life. Now it's arrived. I'm not sure I like it. <laughs> <laughs> That's I, how I feel about the return to the 70s. I, yeah. was, I was working in the H&V shop on Oxford Street at the time. And during the three day week, they, they couldn't light, they couldn't illuminate the store. And so they had to set up tables at the front door. And then if you wanted a record, you know, uh, whatever, an ABBA record or whatever, you'd come and ask for it. And somebody would go into the back of the shop with a lamp and find it and bring it to the front door where you, where you can actually buy it. That's it's amazing. absolutely astonishing to think that that happened in our lifetime. It's really. incredible. It's, we incredible. Should be, it's, it's good to be reminded of these things, actually, right now, when everyone thinks, gosh, what a terrible time we're going through, which it is. But there, there have been terrible times in the past that we've... Uh, but we we've say, sailed out of you know it's, yeah that's very yeah. that's very true and then yes so, so and um, Merry Christmas everybody Slade I mean that they, they that was the they were at the height of their success but at the same time they were going through terrible times their their drummer had, of course had this terrible car crash and lost his memory yeah um, which is really serious and then Slade in Flame which came out in seventy five was just remarkable I mean. So Richard Longcren, the director, he'd, he'd travelled with Slade on this rather disastrous tour of the US and he'd seen it up close. He, you know, he was young, um, thought it was all going to be glamorous and it wasn't glamorous. It was really hard and they were playing to half empty arenas because they never really made it in, in America. Um, and he thought, OK, well, I want to capture a film about the realities of the rock world. And even though Slade in Flame is set in the end, at the end of the 60s, it's so 73, 74, you know, it's all, and you know, it had Alan Lake, who was Diana Dawes' husband, who is a terrible alcoholic. Um, there was a one time when they were filming in, there's a, a scene in a working man's club and they're filming in there. He'd fallen asleep um, during, in the middle of filming and they were just said, and then suddenly he woke up, saw the club owner who he vaguely recognized um, from some prior altercation, got up, sm punched him in the face, got dragged out and uh, Diana Dawes had to come and sort it out because they're going to say oh, I'm going to you know, he's going to be thrown in jail the whole thing so and the entire film was beset by problems there's a scene where Dave Hill who's always the flash one of the band um, goes into a, a Rolls Royce car showroom on um, Park Lane and they're filming it and suddenly this uh, tramp appeared in the wind the, the window like really matted hair just looking absolutely terrible um, and obviously the shot was ruined. And then the tramp came in, okay, and came into the, you know, and was, you know, the old guy on the door opened the door to him. And Richard Longcrane said to the owner of the car show, what the hell are you doing? Why have you let that guy in? And, you know, you basically ruined the shot. And he said, I'm not in the habit of turning Howard Hughes away from my, <laughs> from my, uh, Fantastic. <laughs> from my car showroom. He got completely mad. So, yeah, so it was, all these things were going on at the same time and Slade were, you know, Slade really were a working class band. I mean, you know, while Rod Stewart might have been hanging out at Tramps, they were hanging out at the Trumpet in Bilston. Yes. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it, that... it, it was, and they never really made, well, I think now, I think um, Jim Lee and uh, Noddy Holder made a lot of money, but I don't think the others did. No, so I'm sure was, they, no they didn't. Head Slade much. was still going yeah. with the other two in it. Yeah, for But years. it's also interesting that, right. that Slade are really kind of interesting and emblematic of all this in the sense that they never became cool, did they? Ever. On any level. No. There was never no. a point when they looked cool. They looked as if they'd made it or anything like that. They were kind of... They were British. <laughs> they were kind of backstreet British in a way that you could they really were. You couldn't change them at all, you know. And um, no. one of the things that struck me right, reading this book is that it's the kind of land before cool, isn't it? You know, it, it it's like cool hasn't really been invented. Cool is now the kind of adjective that dominates all conversations, has done for the last 30, 40 years. Before then, it didn't at all, you know. And cool is all about what things look like, isn't it, largely? Well, it, it, that's very true. And actually, what's what's interesting is um, the more I went into this, and I'm a victim of this just as much as everyone else, I realised that credibility is, is based a lot on image. Okay, you know, it's completely. entirely. It's yeah. completely. Totally. Another underground, you know. 
it's it's all people. I mean, the the, the nonsense argument is people say, well, the Velvet Underground or whatever were real, whereas ABBA were not. Oh, that's rubbish. Absolute rubbish. Nothing could be further. From the truth. It's like Neil Tennant said about. I think he said about you too, didn't he? Ages ago, he says people think we're really theatrical. You too are really theatrical. Yeah. It's just a different kind of theatrics, you know. Of course, of course it is. And then you know that, and that's the thing. I mean. I realised, so this is going to the end of the 70s. I mean, this is is an example. Kate Bush is about as credible as it gets. Um, And, you know, very, very, uh, you know, correctly lauded for being totally original. Dollar are about as uncredible as it gets because they look like they just stepped out of a salon, you know, super blonde and everything. I started looking into it and thinking, I I was listening to Shooting Star, one of the early Dollar songs, but this is really clever. I interviewed Teresa Bazaar, who, who... was really upset actually about the terrible pastings they used to get and she said that they she came up with this thing with trevor horn where she would record her backing vocals all her you know her you know, lead vocals up to 50 times do 50 takes uh all slightly different because she had this pure voice but a very light voice and through that you got this kind of celestial haze of sound now that was totally original and no one had done that before but because they were dollar yeah, they weren't certainly weren't celebrated. Now, as a critic, I'm as guilty of this as, as anyone, and I'm sure there are pop songs at the moment which I've derided as you know, kind of uh, just just empty, but which are, which are doing brilliant things, you know. I mean, sometimes it, you need that, that bit of distance to see it. Yeah, I suppose the difference with somebody like Kate Bush is the, people want to believe in a person, don't they? They want to believe in an artist. That's, that's <laughs> very, in, very he true. is this person who dragged it from their guts, whatever, rather than... Yes. As is the They're truth, writing about themselves as well. Yeah, but also, yeah. most pop records, as we discovered, and if you go and look at absolutely the greatest pop records, they're made by six people. You know, they're, they're collaborations. They're not yeah. one pure thought. They can't be, you know. And... Uh, yeah. And, and, and lots of your book is about, you know, that process, isn't it? You know, we tried it with this singer. We tried it with that singer. We changed the lyrics. We moved it about in all kinds of ways, didn't we, to, to, get, to, to get to be a hit. Well, that's right. And I think if, uh, the, the thing that struck me, if, we, if I can mention Love Grows Where My Rosemary Goes. Yeah. Um, uh, that, was, that was a big revelation for me because, first of all, if you listen to that song, it's quite remarkable there's a different chord at every single bar you know it's 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 constant changes which i think something that bowie did but um you know edison lighthouse now that's a band that didn't exist they didn't exist when the song was written did they did they they had to kind of just come together to be able to promote it that's right but that was what's so fascinating so the 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 guy who wrote it a guy called tony mccauley who i'm sure you know um now what had happened with him is that he'd been working with bands he'd had a hit with the foundations and the foundation, and he'd had this huge hit, yes. like, build, build me up Buttercup and stuff at the end of the 60s. And uh, he was really young. And so he got called into the record company offices after it went to number one, thinking, um, you know, no, it's baby now that I found you, I think, that went to number one. Anyway, so, you know, he thought, well, I'm going to, you know, get a pat on the back. The, you know, it's going to be fantastic. And actually what happened is he got told off massively because the foundations had nicked all the microphones in the studio and it cost a fortune. Um, so he had to get them back and they turned up in a black bin liner in a taxi and the whole thing. And he thought, you know, the problem here is the band. Yes. Here, are, here we are, we're working really hard. And then you get a bunch of guys who've been working on a building site one week, they're on top of the pops the next, and there's no bloody discipline. <laughs> so he thought maybe we could eradicate the band. And, you know, we've got the songwriters, we've got all these amazing singers, we've got Tony Burrows, we've got Sue and Sonny, um, we've got her, we've got session musicians like Herbie Flowers and Clem Catini who turn up on time and yes. say play it and they play it perfectly. Yeah, you know, and then they go. Um, and he thought, okay, well, let's get rid of the band. And so, so you know, Edison Lighthouse was created in that way, Tony Burrows. But then, while Tony Burrows was doing Edison Lighthouse, he was doing Pipkins, Gimme That Ding, Gimme That Ding, of, great record. You Brotherhood of Man, um, United We Stand, and other all made up bands. Um, White Plains, My Baby Loves Loving. And a few of them claim, and this is something which has been historically contested, that Tony Burroughs was on the same episode of Top of the Pops in four different made up bands. Fantastic. And then, then, then all the letters started coming in, you know, complaining, saying, oh, it's the same people every week. And um, Roger Greenaway had done this song, um, 
called Current Craze. Uh, sorry, Lady Pearl by Current Craze, 73. And um, the producer of the top, top of the Pops, Robin Nash, phoned up and said, this is great, Current Craze. Who's behind this? I love this song. Let's put it on next week. He said, who's, who's, who's the band? He went, yeah, yeah, well, it's Tony Burroughs, Sue and Sonny, you know, <laughs> Hopi Flowers. And he went, oh, not the same old lot. And he went, well, if it's a hit, what's the problem? And that was the point at which this the made up band thing kind of died for for those guys because there are so many complaints but then it got taken up by jonathan king and john carter who are far more anarchic so jonathan king created hundreds of bands under so many different pseudonyms i don't think even he knew what was his and what wasn't you know so you'll remember johnny reggae by the piglets yeah the piglets or you know um, you know leap up Saint and down and wave your knickers in the air by that's right. I mean, they were yeah. endless, you know, endless, endless, endless. And he, he had this great plan because he was so uncredible. He thought, I'm going to trick John Peel. This is later in the set in the late 70s. So he tricked John Peel by doing a punk version of the times they are changing um, by a band called Babies on Razor Blades. Obviously, totally yeah. made up. And Peel played it. And of course, it was John. It was it was Jonathan King behind the whole thing. So it was it was it was very anarchic. And then John Carter created a whole festivals worth of bands that didn't exist the fat man's music festival kincaid um uh stamford bridge who did a song for chelsea you know i mean just endless well and john carter is such an interesting yeah he's a really interesting character because yeah. he was in john i was john carter from the southerners and jimmy page actually was 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 a member of that That's group right, they were page. incredibly credible at the time and then went on yeah. to produce hits for i don't know the ivy league and herman's herberts and stuff but there's a lovely bit in the book where you talk about he was responsible for an ad uh, the Cadbury Smash ad, is that right? He wasn't I, responsible for it. What happened was not... is that I, I did, for Mash Get Smashed, no, I can't remember who did that. He did, um, there was the guy who did the Shake and Back ad, you remember, to put oh, right. the Shake and Back and put the freshness back. Yeah. But that was, no, he was, he was another guy. No, the, what I was trying to compare, that I don't think he did the Smash ad, but what I thought was that, you everyone remembers the Smash advert, and, you know, yeah. These metallic aliens are laughing at the idiotic earthlings and their stupid ways of making potatoes. You know, they put it for 20 yes. minutes of their yeah, earth right. and all the rest of it. Um, and I thought, well, the smash ad is all about processed food. And in a way, what was happening with John Carter was he was he was finding a way to process music. You know, it was a kind of it was taking away yeah. organic product systems of it all. And again, this was at a time like now when there's huge environmental concerns because it was it was the it was the sort of golden age of yeah. mass farming you know of um suddenly freezing cows were producing you know uh, i know you know tons of milk whereas before they'd produced a few gallons you know it's that kind of thing um and there's a big concern about it all so it felt like you had the kind of more middle class folksy uh folk rock world being concerned about keeping things organic. And then you had this handful of city bound suburbanites mainly actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, creating total inauthenticity and, uh, you know, sort of uh, manufactured goods. So it's a whole coincidence, isn't it, between kind of Ridley Scott's Hovis ad and this return to a kind of old kind of agrarian idyll, isn't it? At the time when Steel Eye Span, all these folk groups were kind of having hits. And it's the way that the advertising world and the music world kind of integrate to reflect a particular time That's that was very much the goal yes i think the the 70s and again you know we always think of uh nostalgia as something yeah, that yeah. We're imbued with but the, the 70s was soaked in nostalgia it was obviously you had the 50s. yeah so it, uh, no, the 70s invented nostalgia you know in the 60s there was no nostalgia nobody was nostalgic for the 50s whatsoever they just come out of it absolutely true and uh, you know happy days comes along in the 70s doesn't it you know it's the idea that oh there was a loss a land of lost yeah. content you know yeah. and, and the adverts totally is the interesting thing because you write quite a lot about um, Chaz and Dave's courage best adverts which were uh, hugely important for obviously for them weren't they I felt it was very important for the for the decade as well because what happened was is that as so Mark mentioned Hovis you know uh, get that yeah. in your lad and all that kind of stuff that was Ridley Scott and that was such a hugely successful ad because it presented this fantasy of an agrarian lost idol which 
It was filmed in Somerset. Everyone thought it was Yorkshire, but it was rural. Um, Dave Trott, who is the uh, advertising director, was tasked with doing a Hovis. That was, that was, that was the brief. He went into his boss's office one day and he saw all these old photographs, you know, the sepia tinted photographs from the 1930s and 40s and earlier. Um, and he had heard Chaz and Dave, who were at that point kind of credible uh, mm -hmm. as a kind of, you know, a blues rock band on Charlie Gillett's show. And he thought it was very interesting. And he went to see them in a pub in Silvertown. And um, he realized that they were doing this kind of, it was, it was somehow connected with punk. It was kind of connected with pub rock. Um, and it was obviously connected with that old working class pub sing-along thing. It was Rockney. Now, Courage Best was in trouble. Yeah, Rockney. Rockney. That's the word, Rockney. You got yeah. it. And, you know, the beer was in trouble because everyone was buying supermarket beer for the first time. Now, what could you do with, um, you know, how could you get people back into the pubs? Well, what you, you weren't selling the beer, you're selling the cam camaraderie, the yeah. fact that people come together in a pub. Um, and that's how they did it. And so they, if you remember those adverts, the sepia tinted photograph comes to life. And then you have a scene from the 1940s or the 1930s of, uh, you know, working class people who might yeah. be down by, by the by down in Margate, or they might be down in, you know, just down in the old Bull and Bush. And um, that's what it was. But it was very, very much, uh, you know, remember a pint of best, courage do. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. You know, it was all a fantasy. I mean, it's the same thing as like a, a, a ploughman's lunch, which I thought was, you know, ploughmanate. It no, was no. invented. <laughs> invented, by, by that's right. It was. It was. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, it's you know, it, it, this was the thing. I mean, all of the music I was looking at, I was kind of thinking how it related to things going on at the time, um, because it was commercial and it was it was TV was the medium. Well, there's a lovely um, bit about about the expansion in Europe, isn't it? The, the suddenly the, the the European holiday boom takes off. So tell us about how that affected. But I mean, again, that's the middle of the road hit was a big part of that, wasn't it? And Eviva was massive, massive. Oh yeah, Eviva Espana was huge. Um, which of course, you know, Sylvia was actually Swedish. The Viva Hispania started off as a as a a very political song. It was a, it was a, it was against Franco's regime. Yeah, you know, it was against the fascist regime of Spain. Um, but you know, so this was at the time when you know previously it was impossible for the average family to go abroad. It just wasn't possible. Yeah. Um, but package holidays made it possible. At the same time, you had Ted Heath's dream of European integration, which was, you know, this was the fascinating thing. I mean. It was very. It was, the left was extremely against it because the, because uh, the EU was seen as a kind of capitalist block. So you know, people like Tony Benn were absolutely dead set against it. But then you had the far right, Enoch Powell, who's obviously just as much against it because of the idea of integration and open borders, immigration and open borders. So Ted Heath was kind of on his own in the sort of um, right of centre middle. Um, but he was, you know, this is his great dream. And by 73, when we did join Europe and the package holiday boom was taking off, you had, <laughs> this is where I kind of wonder if I'm stretching credulity here, but, you know, I think the ultimate anthem of European integration is Chirpy Chirpy Cheap Cheap by Middle of the Road. <laughs> Scottish cabaret band, you know, playing in the Stackis hotels. They used to be, um, you know, doing uh, Latin covers. Yeah. So Croupier offered them the chance to go and play in Argentina. Uh, and they thought, okay, great. They got on the ferry. They ended up being the house band on the ferry to pay their way. They thought, something's wrong here. They got there and the Croupier had debts up to his eyeballs. Um, and they, he abandoned them and they were stuck. And they thought, right, what do we do? Well, the only thing we can do is do what we did before. And we play the, play the clubs, play the hotels. They're, in a, um, a, they're playing in a club just outside Rome, I think it was at the top of a hill and Sophia Loren was at the bottom trying to get her kid to sleep and she got fed up. So she went up there to complain and thought, oh, they're quite good actually. And so then she hired them and they came to Rome to record with her while they were there. Um, uh, an Italian uh, executive said, well, we got this song by this guy, another British guy called La Lally, S Lally Scott, called Chirpy Chirpy Cheap Cheap. They all thought it was awful, absolutely awful. You know this song about uh well you could say it's about parental neglect in a way you know the the, the the mother's gone and the bird has been left on its own 
Um, anyway, they recorded it. They had to drink a bottle of whiskey to get through it. And it became <laughs> a hit through Europe, one country by one. And England was the last. And so it went all through Europe. And by the time it got to England, it was Chris, um, Tony Blackburn who, who pushed it. Um, everyone thought they were Italian because it had been a hit everywhere else. And so when they, when they played Top of the Pops, Pan's people, one of them spoke Italian. And they came up to um, middle of the road and uh, said in their best Italian, where are you from? And Ken Andrew, the drummer, went, Glasgow. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was that. So they were, that was, that was at the heart of, and, you know, there was a Viva Hispania. There's also Una Paloma Blanca, yeah. which yeah. was, Jonathan, again, Jonathan King and the George Baker selection. You know, people, it would be like going to Benidorm and you get the straw donkey, but then you also get Eviva Espana because it's a, it's a, it's a memento. So it was that summer smash thing. And it was, yeah. and you know, you, you start looking back at that time and there's so much fascination, but also fear of Europe. So if you look at, are you being served? The, you know, when they go to the Costa Plonka, it's called. Oh, that's right. Or, um, you know, or uh, the Carry On Abroad. And, you know, there, there's... Yes. A, Are you there's taking a, wine with that or brown ale, sir, or something, isn't it? Isn't that's that, the one. That's that was the, the line. Exactly. That's, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's all that. And, you know, they get... In, in Carry On Abroad, they get stuck in the local brothel after, after Charles Hawtrey goes crazy, you know. Um, it was... There was this thing... I, I think there was a, a, a marketing report done at the time finding out what British people were scared of when they went abroad. Food, flying, foreigners... In foreigners, that's yeah. right. <laughs> no, <laughs> didn't that reflect well on us? <laughs> no. So, so you know, is this is this a world that is just that, that went away when when the video arrived and you know the the eighties? You know, meant it was all about personality and it was all about cool and stylishness and so forth. Was the, this is a world that could only kind of flourish in the in the halcyon days at the top of the pops with twenty five million people watching and wheel tappers and shunters and all that all that kind of thing. It was corny television, wasn't it? That was the that was the ground that all this grew in. It very much was. And it's work it's uh, working men's club culture, wheel tappers and shunters, yeah. Saturday night at the Palladium. I mean yeah. also, you know, if you're broke, what can you afford to do? You can afford to sit sit indoors and watch Saturday night at the Palladium. You know, yeah. and and the fans will come, and you can afford to watch Top of the Pops. You might be able to afford to go down to the, to the you know the local working men's club. So it was very much that, but also the bands themselves. I mean, it was a small world. It was not sophisticated. There wasn't the same money in it, and it wasn't international. So I think by the nineteen eighties, you have Michael Jackson and Madonna and yeah. Prince and Bruce Springsteen and just huge stars. At the same time, the smash hits world, which, you know, you, you could tell me much more about it than I know, but I get the feeling that, you know, the video then means that everyone can be a personality in and of themselves. Completely. As opposed to Edison Lighthouse, where you have Tony Burroughs, yeah. you know, being a good singer, glamorous, you know, we're dressing up for television. But, you know, Sue and Sonny then were, were working in James Last. Yeah, back. I mean, the 80s is broadly about, about pop stars because everybody identified with them as, as kind of individuals and, and felt they connected with them. And, and the 70s was about more, more about records, all of it. Songs. It, just songs. Yeah, songs. Precisely, it was songs, just tracks. You, you, didn't, you didn't care who it was who was, who was behind it. Well, it's whether I mean, or not well, it worked in a disco. You know? Well, last night I was, I, was on a, I was on the train um, going back to my house in Peckham. And on the way, I don't know anything about football, but... Uh, QPR fans I worked out were piled onto the train and they were going to Millwall and they were all singing Chirpy Chirpy Cheap Cheap. <laughs> so right. I know many of them yeah. knew that that was middle of the road or they could say that, oh yes, Sally Carr, she used to wear hot pants. Do you know yeah. what I mean? It was, that melody had survived and I think they'd changed the words a bit, but it's a football chant. Absolutely. You know, so, so these songs, I mean, you know, they, so many people so i mean when i was talking about this book and i was pitching it to the publishers the, the younger people working at the publishers didn't know what i was talking about moldy old dough or whatever but if it, if they heard the melody they were oh, this one you yes. know what i mean yeah yeah, yeah you know yeah. they'd survive so they're kind of uh, the the so-called cheesy throwaway pop the truth is it lasts just as long as any other form of popular music it can do. It can do, definitely. I think so. And I think also it's, it's, it's just as relevant, you know, because, you know, when something goes out to millions of people, it's going to have a story to tell. 
Um, so yeah, that's that's very much how I felt. Um, and the people your age felt really connected to it because you were really young when a lot of this, you were only about what four, five, six when some of these well, records I'm, were coming I'm out. I'm fifty-two. I'm fifty-two. So that yeah. means that I was um, um, tiny when in the you know too young to remember. But the, you know you're, when you're two or three, I guess you have these kind of flashes. But by five or six, you can sort of remember. Yeah, yeah. I remember Supersonic. You know, I remember Punk. But, yeah, but punk in my mind, and you know, I had to approach punk somehow because I wanted to cover. You know, I felt that it was relevant, but it had been done so much, and so I was kind of looking at how kids looked at punk. And yeah. of course, it was in Oh Boy and My Guy and all these things. You know, they they actually quite liked it and found it quite funny. And I remember finding it funny and entertaining. Sid Vicious was this sort of cartoon character. Yeah, you know, so in my it wasn't so different from Mark Bolan to me. You know, so it's and I think it's normal to. Uh, be very nostalgic about that period in your childhood, yeah. which is all a bit of a haze. But yeah, so that was that was the thing. But also, it was like I mean, I'm I I've been a classic record collector nerd, going into obscure acid folk or prog or whatever it is. And so to go down this path, which is the stuff that you know those TV programs they used to make about the world's worst songs. You know, they it yeah. would always be you know, give me that ding and all the old dough and stuff. Um, and they're thinking, well, if they're really the world's worst songs, they just be forgotten a years ago because millions of songs are, there's obviously something yeah. about them that, that keeps them around. So yeah, there was, it was, it was really, it was really interesting to kind of delve into it and, and try and make the connections between everything that was happening. Yeah. Well, it's a fantastic book. And, uh, yeah, well, it's called in perfect, in perfect Harmony, Sing Along Pop in the 1970s. Will, thank you so much for talking to us. Absolutely brilliant. Well, thank you. Thank you, and, Mark. Uh, thank you, David. Always a pleasure.